Meanwhile, South Africans continue to cheat on developments following the cabinet reshuffle announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa. He cited, of course, uh, vacancies that needed to be filled and uh, uh, strategic considerations, including recent developments in South Africa, violent unrest, and you would know there's also been COVID-19, which has uh, brought pressure to bear to talk about uh, how South Africans are viewing this uh, the strategic nature or lack thereof, including where this will take us as a country. We're joined now by advocate Mudidima Manya, who's a legal analyst and a public commentator, Professor Susan Boyson, political analyst. So a very good evening to you and thank you so much for speaking to us. We know a lot of people have been talking about this, who's been taken where and why. But what's been very important to note has been the appointment of Tandi Mudise in that of defence. She has obviously Obviously not being sworn in yet due to processes that need to happen in Parliament. But do we know what those processes might be? Let me start with you, Advocate uh, Manya. Well, uh, <clears throat> Sapi, so the process is simple. Uh, when immediately after an election, the Chief Justice presides over the election of a Speaker. A Speaker is elected from amongst the members of Parliament. And if for any reason the Speaker vacates the office, whether because of death or resignation or for any other reason, there would have to be a process to elect a new Speaker. And it is the same process uh, that would be followed. I suppose that at the moment uh, there are probably handover processes, which must then release um, uh, uh, Ms. Mudise from being the Speaker of the National Assembly and to have either the deputy speaker uh, taking over in an acting capacity until a speaker is elected. But nothing turns on any delay in her being swear, uh, sworn in as a minister. Mm. Professor Boyson said those who suggested that there might be a breach of the separation of powers in appointing the Speaker of Parliament, who's appointed by all political party members who are members of the National Assembly. What are your thoughts around this? Did uh, the president make such a transgression in your view? Well, she, given that she is still at this the point um, the Speaker of Parliament and that she has not been sworn in as in the new Minister of Defence, I do not think there has been a breach. It's important to remember that, as the advocate also broadly pointed out, the Speaker is an elected position. So she cannot a successor cannot immediately step into that position because an election has to be done by Parliament. And Parliament is currently still in recess. I believe they are reconvening on the, around the 18th of August. So it's possibly a process that I will have to take a bit of time and that there will not be a, an immediate assumption of the position of Minister of Defence. Hmm. Uh, having said that, Advocate Manya, it, it's about the spirit there of, of this decision. We know that political parties often are clamoring to be consulted on such important decisions. But for those who are critical of the appointment, does it indeed create a hierarchy of importance between the executive and parliament? Not really. I think we people have become just over, overly imaginative and suspicious. Remember, all the members of parliament currently come from political parties. And nothing precludes a political party from recalling any of the deployees in parliament. Ms. Modisa is a member of parliament before she becomes the speaker. In her own right, she is entitled to resign as the speaker, and parliament can't force her to continue as a speaker. So the president is appointing from among members of parliament, who by coincidence, one of them turns out to be the Speaker of the National Assembly, and there's no issue around the violation of the separation of powers. What would constitute a separation, a violation of the separation of powers was if the president himself so, said, I am removing the Speaker and I'm appointing him uh, or her as a member of the uh, 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 executive. I, I, we have not yet had, Ms. Marisa can say, I decline the appointment as a member of cabinet, the president can't force him either. 
So I think we are being over imaginative okay. uh, over this matter. All right. So let, let's continue looking at the overall picture. Professor Susan Boyson, uh, the reshuffle, how strategic were some of the choices that were made, given the fact that of the three ministers said to be behind the intelligence debacle, two women were trounced and a man remained. And I'm saying this in light of the AC's own commitment to the 50 50 representativity um, rule or uh, policy. But there's also the fact that um, there are those who would have felt that if you are going to remove some ministers, why not move some deputy ministers up? Share your thoughts with us on. Yes, indeed. Well, it's very pivotal that it is the security cluster that is at stake here in the deployments to that position. And given the turmoil that we've had in the country in the month of July, there is no messing around, there's no space to make additional mistakes, subsequent mistakes, after the, there's been great tolerance of a very, very ineffective and discredited state security agency. And now this is the time to get it right, because we have already seen in last month the effects of lapses of security, lapses of intelligence that has happened there. And yes, it is regrettable that the woman quota that was previously very, very favorable is has lapsed in some ways. But still, the women in cabinet stand very strongly. Num numbers, numbers remain good in cabinet overall in these particular positions. Wherever, whichever person is possibly the best qualified should really get into that. We do not know whether the persons appointed obviously will be the best possible, but. Uh, we can at least hope the president, in the sense of assuming responsibility for the state security agency, which is now dissolved, and that function moved into the presidency, at least we can trust that that is in good hands and that some of the trusted lieutenants are there as either ministers or deputy ministers and that they will know exactly what their work entails and that there is no space for additional mm. mistakes well, uh, because it's state security that is at stake here. All right. Advocate Manya, the, those who would characterize what has happened or what has forced the president's hand as being a, a revolt, if it is indeed a toss up between keeping the peace between factions and asserting your stranglehold on power, how do you gauge which constituencies you can afford to alienate and those which you must put uh, at the forefront? Yes, Sabisa, I think. <clears throat> We, we must always remember that we are using a party political system and therefore there would be dynamics. I mean, I think imagine a situation if the ruling party did not have an outright majority, it would have to engage with other parties to enable it to form a government, as you can see the situation in Israel. But that aside, the, the president has got certain legal and constitutional obligations. He's got a responsibility to protect us. He's got a responsibility to ensure that law and order is maintained. I think the events of the past weeks must have pro prompted any reasonable leader to take one or the other form of action. And I think Professor Wilson is right. We can't tell at this stage whether those that have been appointed are the best people or whether they will fail or succeed. And we can only hope in the interest of the country that they do so. But the president operates in a wholly a political environment. We have seen the shenanigans in the DA. We have seen what happens in all other political parties. So either way, there will be a complaint one way or the other. And I think for me, my interest is whether the president is acting within the confines of the law and the constitution and whether he has appointed fit and proper persons. That is persons who at least meet the requirements uh, to be appointed to the executive. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Professor Susan Poissons, very briefly, just your word on this. Yes, indeed. Uh, it is very important that those positions are filled and by the strategically right people. And whether it's whichever faction, I think we know by now Sarah Rampos has really strengthened his position, not just in the NEC or the ANC, but also in cabinet. And he stands very strongly. And therefore, there are so many different permutations of factions between Zumas and Ramaphosas and people having moved over on, on whatever grounds they have been moving over to Ramaphosa. So his position is pretty much consolidated. And from within these crucial ANC structures, there is no obvious threat to him. So at least that gives him more leeway to appoint people. Okay.
for skills and not just play the political balancing game. Okay, so thank you so much for speaking to us, Professor Susan Boyson. As always, thank you for your time. We'll continue with what you've just mentioned, the legal ramifications, especially when it comes to what has just happened recently in court. We mentioned the fact that the Concord has written to both... Uh, uh, former President Jacob Zuma and his lawyers, including those of others who are interested in his uh, court bid to uh, reduce, in fact, to obliterate his uh, um, detention in prison. Let's see if we can also bring up uh, some of what was played earlier on at our uh, sister program, and that is uh, Jimmy Manye, who is the spokesperson for the Jacob Zuma Foundation. Just speak a little bit uh, about this very issue. Okay, yeah, we'll see if we can get that uh, back on. So, Advocate uh, Manya, I'd like to hear from you. The uh, Constitutional Court issuing that directive to the legal teams of the former president and uh, the other parties to make a submission, as I said, uh, addressing the international law and constitutional implications of his ongoing detention. What is the significance of this move at this moment? Well, Tepiso, let me first uh, uh, indicate that the high courts generally would issue directives. Uh, we, as lawyers, we are required in any case to make written submissions called heads of argument uh, before a matter is heard, because part of our responsibility is to assist the court to identify what the legal issues are and to make a pronouncement. So there's nothing unusual with the constitutional court issuing a direction to be addressed on a matter which it has been has been canvassed as part of the uh, course of action in the matter of former president zuma but i think the second issue is that our constitution is very specific that the courts when they they, <clears throat> they deal with these matters must consider international law but must consider international law does not elevate international law above the supremacy of our constitution the, the constitution of the republic of south africa remains the supreme law but as you would have seen from the directive the specific reference to two clauses in the convention on uh, civil and political rights and one of them is clause uh, article 9 which deals with uh, the prohibition of uh, arbitrary arrest and detention and that clause, by the way, is mirrored in Section 12 of our Constitution, which is part of the Bill of Rights, which prohibits the same thing. The same you'll find in Article 14, which deals with fair trial, which is mirrored in Section 34 of our Constitution in the Bill of Rights, which makes provision for access to courts and a fair trial. So requesting the parties to make uh, submissions, in my view, does not necessarily by any means suggest that the Constitutional Court is feeling any guilt. Mm -hmm. I think what the Constitutional Court is doing is to say somebody has approached us to say we ought to have applied Article 9 and Art Article 14. So let's hear the argument on Article 9 and Article 14. But as I say, Article 9 and Article 14 are respectively represented in Article 12 okay. and Article 34 of our Constitution. Advocate Maya, allow me to jump in because uh, Professor Susan Boyson's mentioned earlier on the possible impact on the political landscape of some of these issues. And uh, I I'm asking this particular question to see if one can lend itself to the other. For instance, uh, running on this ticket of the legal principles or lack thereof in terms of observing that. Dr. Zaini Zuma, for instance, we've heard that uh, he is announcing his political ambitions and this after allegations of incitement to prevent uh, his father's imprisonment so uh, would it be conflating the two these two developments or uh, could it be used as a strong case uh, to run uh, to say uh, this is where South Africa is failing in terms of constitutionalism and the legal international legal statutes that it's subscribed to well, let, let me give you three separate answers to address all the issues you raised. Firstly, uh, Mr. Zuma Jr. will have to meet the requirements of the ANC constitution to contest. I'm not sure whether he qualifies. I'm very doubtful, uh, knowing that you have to meet certain thresholds to, to, con to contest uh, leadership in the, in, the, in the ANC. Secondly, the, the, there could be a relationship 
because in political terms, you would use any opportunity that gives you the type of crowd or numbers that you need to achieve what you want to achieve. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if he wants to use that as political mileage uh, to gain an upper hand in a contest that he intends to, 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 to pursue. But let me just share something with you that's intriguing. You know, the world over, uh, we have had presidents and sons of presidents and daughters of presidents. George W. Bush is such an example. Um, uh, John Quincy Adams in America, there are two presidents actually who produced sons who became president. Uhuru Kenyatta in, in Kenya is the son of a, a former president of Kenya. Ian Kama in Botswana, the mm -hmm. same thing. In South Korea, we have had the same thing. Indira Gandhi in India. All right. So I don't think there's anything that turns on the son or daughter of a president being ambitious to become a president. You still have to go through. Uh, Joseph Kabila, as you remember, okay. succeeded his father after the, the assassination. Okay. So I don't think anything turns on that. All right. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. Advocate Mudidima Manya, legal analyst and political commentator.